Yay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out for this chat. Uh, I'll be talking about Seago, which is the uh, Go library for accessing C code. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm Charles Hathaway. I work at YadaDB. Uh, one thing we do at YadaDB is write wrappers for our database engine in a variety of languages. One of those languages is Go. It has been a challenging road. And I'll be the first to come out and say we still have a little bit of distance left to travel on the road. So if anybody here is a Seago expert and wants to comment or ask questions, it may help us in solving some problems we continue to have. But if you can't do that, that's totally fine. I still love questions, so feel free to ask them as I'm presenting. Just raise your hand, shout out. Um, good. All right, so uh, I'm going to start by doing a quick review of what YadaDB is, what Go is, and what C is. Does anybody here not know what C is? Does anybody here not know what Go is? Okay, great. Uh, YadaDB is a NoSQL database engine. Uh, it's a hierarchical key value store that does very, very good with transaction processing. Uh, operates on a single node rather than a cluster so that we can have strong ACID guarantees, which are valuable to very many applications. Uh, it's deployed in a number of industries, healthcare and finance leading among them, where it's been for quite some time or where its code base has been for some time. Uh, although YadaDB is young, our code base has a long, strong lineage, starting as a product which I shall not name. Uh, and so we know that the product works because it's been powering applications for many, many years. All right, Go is a little bit newer. I think it came out in the early 2010s. It is a um, garbage collected programming language with static typing. Um, one big thing that it does that it's very well known for is very good co uh, concurrency paradigms. So what it does is take some ideas from Erlang where we have multiple threads that communicate amongst each other and they, they do multi-threading by passing information between them and it mixes that with a little bit of C-ish code. So Erlang, for those who don't know, is functional. C is not a functional language, and turns out people kind of like non-functional uh, paradigms because they're a little bit easier to use. So Go is this uh, mix of all these, I don't know, best parts, worst parts of C, Erlang, Java, take your pick. Uh, we have a fake inheritance type thing we can do where we implement traits on certain uh, uh, data types to allow you to perform uh, class-based type things, but that's not really what it is. So it's, it's a language in of itself, and it's, it's all kind of fun. Um, the big thing it has going for you for it is the cooperative multi-threading. So the idea is that it spawns off six system threads, and then you can spawn off as many Go routines, which can execute on an arbitrary thread as you want, as in hundreds of thousands or millions, and it doesn't care, right? So that's its strong point. C uh, is a low-level programming language, uh, which started life in the 1970s, I believe. It's a little bit older than Go, a little bit older than YadaDB. Uh, it's everywhere, right? So Linux is written in C, yes? All right, and then we all know what that is. We have other important projects written in C, including Apache, including, uh, I don't know, uh, I hear something about an NTP program that was once written in C, things like that. Uh, one of the strong benefits of C is it's relatively close to the hardware, so you have a lot of control over how you do uh, access to the data types, right? So you can cast a 32-bit integer as a four-byte character array, and then from there you can access each byte of the integer directly and perform manipulation on that. So being so close to the language, to the, uh, to the hardware, you get a lot of power. It's very expressive. Just don't screw up, right? If you screw up, you can shoot yourself in the foot. C will say, good, keep on doing that. And when you get out of the hospital, let me know. Uh, it does do static typing. However, it does not have any kind of garbage collection. You use a uh, system uh, calls like malloc and free in order to allocate memory and then you are responsible for later freeing it. Should you fail to free it, memory leak. Right? Any questions on C? We all know it, so I'm going to keep going. All right. Oh. So uh, Golang calling into C. So one reason we want to do this for YadaDB specifically 
is we exposed a C API, which allows you to interface with the database engine directly as if it was a library. Uh, in addition, I mean, you have a whole bunch of C applications that have a lot of functionality. And it would be wonderful to be able to access those from Go. So the Go dev team made something called Cgo, which is a very creative name, uh, which gives you a way to call C code at runtime. And it does this by allowing you to link against C code during their compilation process. They have some additional hooks in there to give you the opportunity to include things like uh, package uh, library paths, include directories, things like that. Those are handled by comments. I don't actually spend a lot of time on those because we have plenty to talk about and they're kind of the uh, busy work of the day. All right. More interesting challenge here is that Go is garbage collected, which means you know when you're done with an object, it eventually gets cleaned up and freed. C is not garbage collected. So resolving the conflict in those two paradigms uh, makes for some interesting work. Uh, CGO has a very long web page that is a wall of text, and it establishes a lot of rules about how you use CGO, what kind of additional utilities it provides in addition to, say, just uh, calling it. One of the things that goes over very, very clearly is the rules by which you may pass things into Seago. Uh, I'm going to read this. And my point in reading this is that it is a block of text which is a little bit hard to parse and hard to remember. Go code may pass a Go pointer to C provided the Go memory to which it points does not contain any Go pointers. The C code must preserve this property. It must not store any Go pointers in Go memory, even temporarily. When passing a pointer to a field in a struct, the Go memory in question is the memory occupied by the field, not the entire struct. When passing a pointer to an element in an array or slice, the Go memory in question is the entire array or the entire backing array of the slice. Okay. The gist. Yeah. The gist is that we're not supposed to pass pointers to GoLand. Uh, the idea is that we want to allow Go to perform memory management. So we want to avoid passing embedded pointers because things may be garbage collected, they may be moved around, and they may just kind of vanish, right? And if we pass pointer to those things, C tries to write to that memory location, bad things happen. So I'm going to go over a bunch of examples of things you can and can't do in Go, uh, in C Go, and as we do this, we start to see some of the, uh, the dragons that are hidden within the depths of, uh, of Go and C Go. Here's kind of the most simple example of CGO that I could find, or that I could make. We declare a function in C uh, called myFunc, which takes an integer argument, adds 42, and returns a value. And then in Go, we import C, and we call that function. This is super easy, right? No problems. Uh, we could also do this with characters. And in this case, the character will be interpreted as an integer. But nobody really uses characters for integers because we have integers. Instead, we tend to use characters for strings. Unfortunately, uh, Go's notion of a string is different than C's notion of a string. Uh, one reason why is it uses, U I believe it supports UTF-8 stuff, and C, uh, that gets a little bit more fun. So if we try passing a Go string into a C function, we get a compilation error. Cannot use hello world type string as type star c type char in argument to c func my func. All right. So, yeah, we can't just pass strings like that. We got to find a way to work around it. There's a, a few different ways we can do this. I'm going to start kind of taking an iterative approach where we work our way to a solution that makes sense and is a little bit robust. First thing we could try doing is moving the string into a variable. You get the same thing. That's not really different, but it helps me in reorganizing my code a smidgen. Then let's uh, take a pointer to the string, right? So what we do here is we interpret the string as an array of bytes, which is basically what it is. We do an unsafe pointer to the first, uh, to a reference to the first element in the ar array uh, that represents the string. 
Anybody here familiar with ghost slices? Anybody want to speculate on why we can't just pass a slice in? Slice isn't the data itself, right? Hmm? It's a pointer, and it also has um, the length of the po of the thing it points to, and the length available of the thing it points to. But it contains a go pointer, so we can't pass a slice directly. Instead, we have to do this funny little thing where we get the first element in the underlying array and then take the memory address of that and pass that into CGO. So this is a good first go at attempting to pass a uh, string into CGO. Important things to note is that the string is still garbage collected. So CGO will, hmm? Who is we and which mis Okay, and you're referring What is the Mac OS 6 memory model? So That's an I'm not I'm not sure that what you're saying maps to exactly what happens in Go, but uh, I'm interested in what you mean by you when you say mistake. Are you well, saying that that method's too I'm complex? <laughs> Ah, that's called Rust. Yeah. That's really hard, as it turns out, for a lot of reasons. Hmm? Yes, super hard. Uh, Go doesn't do that. As you know, Go uh, keeps track of what pointers are alive, a lot like the JVM, and it does a sweep and clean up kind of deal. right? So it will mark things as ready for deletion, it will free them, and then it will continue along. Uh, and the Go garbage collector, Right, so slices, which are pointers to pointers, um, which represent data in Go space. Uh, there's some hidden dragons we got going here. Uh, first off, you can't pass this into CGO for the obvious reason that it's a slice, but you could totally pass this. The difference is that slight change in syntax where we give a fixed size changes it from a slice to an array, right? So now we can totally pass that because it's not a pointer. It's a contiguous array of memory, all right? And as I mentioned, we get to do this fun thing. And the important thing to remember here is that a slice is simply a wrapper for a, uh, an array, and we want to take the memory address of the first element. But what happens if we start talking about more complex data structures, right? Say a uh, struct which contains a pointer to a string. We can easily declare a C my struct and put in a string and a compilation error, right? Uh, we went over this, so let's try using the same approach we used to fix this just a minute ago to try and put a character string in here. Right, this looks familiar. Well, I have good news for you. This will totally compile, not a problem. But uh, any observant people want to point out what's wrong with this? All right, we have a pointer to a Go item inside a structure, which we are taking a pointer of and passing into a C function. So we compile because Go doesn't know this at compile time because it's not quite as strict about these things as Rust. 
But uh, when we try to run it, it will fail. It might take some time. You might have to run it many times, but it will fail. Right? Um, we could do this. We could use c.cstring, which is a helper that Go provides in order to create a C style character string, uh, which means it's terminated in a null character, backslash zero. And uh, this will also compile, and it runs. However, speaking of things we're still working on learning, uh, this, as written, leaks memory all over the place. When you do c.cstring or you do c.malloc, you are now responsible for freeing the memory that you allocated, which makes Go's garbage collector not super helpful, right? So how can you get around this? Uh, you could manually free it. And by manually, I mean defer c.free so that even if your exception panics, you still know your memory is getting freed. Uh, this is kind of meh because now, meh, you know, you have to remember to do it. And I, for one, am horrible at that. And I'll forget it all the time, which is why I like garbage collected memories, uh, programming languages, or programming languages which are smart about calling malloc for me. And, uh, you know, if you have kind of a more complex data flow where you may allocate something which gets used in the calling function, this gets kind of ugly. Or if you have an object that lives for a little while in a structure that gets passed around, it gets kind of ugly and it's kind of hard to know when to free it. And this is exactly why Go has a garbage collection function. It would be absolutely wonderful if we could somehow utilize that to ensure that our memory gets freed. Go has a notion of something called a finalizer. Does anybody who speaks Go know what a finalizer is? There's no gophers in here? Good, because uh, finalizers make gophers very, very angry. They get very grumpy at people who use them. The reason is that they're a little bit abusive. The way it works is that when Go detects an object is ready to be freed, if it sees a finalizer set on the object, rather than freeing that, it calls the finalizer sets the finalizer to nil, and then copies object over. And the next time that we go to free it, we actually do the free, right? So when we know we no longer have any pointers to it, we call the finalizer. And then the next time there's a garbage collection event, we free it. Um, something which I believe was stolen from C Sharp, I believe. I'm not a C Sharp extra expert. Um, and this makes gophers very angry because it's very impure. The idea is that it's uh, kind of it's it's something you don't expect, and it's it's not a fun place to be. Uh, but you know, it works, right? Sure, sounds good. It works. I don't have to worry about calling C dot free. My memory doesn't get leaked. Life goes on. All right. Uh, but there's a problem. All right, so here's a slightly modified example where uh, I, I changed the my func to take a pointer to the character string which underlies, uh, which is embedded inside my C structure. All right, the problem here is a little bit nuanced, and it's it's kind of annoying. Remember how I said Go has a garbage collector. In this case, go, if c.myfunk takes a long time, may observe that message does not get used later. So it will say, hey, I will free message. And this may not be the behavior you want if you have certain assumptions in your C code. So we need some way of telling go to keep message alive, MSG alive. Um, you could do this by just putting a reference to it later in the function. It, it gets kind of hard to manage because it turns out compilers optimize things, and if you just do like, you know, a set and later no retrieval ever, it'll just take that away and then do the garbage collection on you anyway. Instead, what you can do is, uh, oh, geez, I already explained that. Instead, what you can do is import runtime and call a function called keep alive. Uh, I don't know what this does behind the scenes in the back code. I haven't looked, but I'm really hoping it keeps MSG alive. Right? It seems reasonable. And uh, we hope that that prevents Go from freeing things we don't want it to go. Um, so without that, we call the finalizer, 
we free the C memory as the C code is still running, bad things happen. With that, we don't call the finalizer until we go out of this function. Right? Any questions so far? Okay. So I'm going to talk about the next thing we had to overcome. Um, callbacks. Anybody who's worked in C has seen a function which takes a pointer to a void star, uh, I'm sorry, a function which takes an argument which is a pointer to a function that returns void and takes a void star argument. That is a callback in C. That is how you do it. That's how everybody does it. It's C. You don't have a choice. You can't pass functions directly. You can only pass these pointers to the functions. Uh, you see them a lot in UI frameworks. You see them a lot in certain database engines which have strong transaction guarantees. Um, and it's kind of a useful mechanism for controlling the scope of starting and restarting transactions if they fail to commit because there was contention. So we use it in, in YadaDB. Um, and uh, it's hard when you start talking about Go. This took us a little while to figure out. So the first thing we're going to do is define a function which takes that void pointer. I'm sorry, the pointer to the function which returns void and is a function. Uh, and we're going to just call it. It doesn't actually do anything. I suppose it's supposed to print here. But unfortunately, this does not compile, right? Uh, we get an error because uh, C, you, you can't pass a pointer to a go thing to C. You can't pass a pointer to the go function to C. Instead, you have to do something pretty kind of hacky, in my opinion. You have to, uh, A, create a new file where you put your function declaration. You have to do this to prevent linker problems uh, related to the way Go actually exports the function. And then you have to add this magic comment, export callback, uh, uh, or export function game, more generally, in the second file. Um, and by the way, you also need to put import C somewhere in that file, and if you forget that, you will be tearing your hair out, trying to figure out why your linker isn't resolving things. And then you have to declare it as an extern in the C code uh, in the function in which you intend to use it. Does this cross Go package or does this only work within a single Go package? Are you referring to exposing the callback? Yeah, that so yeah, yes, it could. Uh, this goes down to kind of a C thing. In C, you can declare an extern, and you're promising the compiler that that will be resolved by the time you finish linking. So as long as the extern gets resolved when you finish linking, it doesn't matter where it's actually defined. So you could totally define it in another function. But <laughs> you could not refer to it in your Go code directly, right? OK, so the question was, what happens if you have two different packages and you export the same named function? The same thing that always happens with C, you get a linker error. Because there's no namespacing, right? So you have a problem. Yeah. I'm not super familiar with the problem you're talking about, but I could totally see that in Python. Right. It's, yes, it's later. Yeah. Yeah, no, you'll get a compilation error here, and you'll tear your hair out because the error message is actually not very helpful because it refers to a C file which is generated by the Go compiler, which you can't see. So you don't do that, please. That would make me very sad. Yeah, that's true. So yeah, there's like a lot of tricks to this. You guys are asking some of them. It's good questions. I love questions, please. Uh, but um, 
This means that if we want the users to use our code, which would be nice, we, we do like users, please use our code, let us know what you think about it, uh, they have to write all of the stuff if they're doing transactions. This tends to be a bit error prone. I can tell you I have lost many hours tracking down uh, me forgetting to put this statement, the import C statement. I forgot, I didn't think about it, and uh, I wasted like four or five hours trying to figure out why my code was linking wrong. You Google it, you get nothing helpful. There's not a lot of linters for C Go. Okay, so like Go has a bunch of tools that does some amount of linting. Um, yeah, we, C Go isn't super popular. It's kind of a beast to work with and the people that use it, I don't know. I, we didn't find any linters that found that for us. If you know of any, we'll be glad to use it. Feel free to run it on our code base and let us know what it turns up. Maybe it'll give us some answers. All right, but yeah, we don't have linters. It's an error prone process. Uh, the other thing worth mention is you can't import C in Go test files. For those who don't know how Go does testing, I have package main here. I can declare package main underscore test in the same folder. It is the only case where I'm allowed to do that, where I'm allowed to have two packages in the same folder. Uh, and the thing is, Go looks for that underscore test keyword and it says, ah, it's a test. Uh, if I do that, I am not allowed to import C. So now I have to create some kind of infrastructure to allow me to import a C function into my testing code so that I can verify my callback function works as expected. Uh, gets kind of ugly, gets kind of annoying to manage. Uh, this also requires that you have some knowledge of C because you have to declare a uh, intermediary function which takes your thing and returns the callback. Uh, Go programmers, may or may not know C, we are, uh, I don't know, we're trying to give them a Go API, so why do we require them to know C? It seems kind of silly. So we gotta find a way to work around this um, without requiring users to do a lot of manual things. Our first attempt was we added a, uh, a uh, we had a tool which would generate your, C s your Go scaffolding for you. And the idea was you would include that using Go generate which is another special Go comment that gets run when you run the Go tool with the generate argument. It still required you to manually run Go generate. Um, still produced C files, still had some kind of problems, and you still can't test it. So, you know, it wasn't great. Eventually, we figured out that you could write a callback function. We could write a callback function, which would call a Go routine. And it can find that Go routine by when you wrap the yadadb tp function, storing the callback in a hash, hash map, or an array, except there's some little tricks to that. We just used a hash map. Um, so this is kind of a mind-blowing for C developers, because now we are not passing a pointer to a function, but we're passing the function itself. Right? This is new and exciting areas. All right? Uh, this is what our TP wrapper looks like. This is the callback. So we have a TP index, which is a unique number representing the latest available TP function. We have the map where we store things. And then we have code. Uh, and this gets called from our C library. And it's passed a few arguments. Um, a TP token, an error string, a uh, TP FN parm, and see that's your void star thing. And what we're passing as the void star thing is just a integer. So we cast it to an integer, and then we retrieve the function from our map, and we run it, all right? And this seems to work pretty well for most of our users. Uh, it does have some kind of things. Um, a, it, there's a small performance hit, because you have to deal with taking that, that map you have to lock the map, increment your counter, assign your function, and then unlock the map using a mutex. In C er, in Go, it's not as horrible as it could be because we have the cooperative multi-threading thing. Um, it's a little bit weird to think about if you're somebody from C or any other kind of older compiled language. Um, but you know, we can get over that. The kind of more interesting question is how do we pass arguments to the callback? 
because we can't have the callback take an arbitrary number of uh, arguments since we have to declare the expected prototype in our Go code, right? Uh, anybody have thoughts on this one? Hmm? Sure, so passing an array is a possibility. Okay, and then the other suggestion was Go offers very, uh, very Arctic arguments, and they all have to be the same type. And uh, yeah, uh, so what you could do is pass an array of interface with that empty curly brace things, and you could pass things that way. Um, we looked into that, ended up being kind of annoying. I forget exactly why. Uh, what we ended up figuring out uh, was closures. So, you know, when you declare an anonymous function in Go, it looks to its parent's scope and resolving variables it can't find. So we can do something like this. And now this func has access to i, which is declared in the parent scope. Uh, and this ended up working pretty well because it uh, takes care of the complexity of dealing with that interface object and dealing with the array and things like that. And it might be worth mentioning, actually, those are the same uh, solution. Because behind the scenes, a very attic thing just gets converted to an array. Right. So, and uh, you know, we're, we did some testing on how, how horrible this performs and it doesn't seem to be ridiculous. So we're, we're kind of going with that and hoping it works out. But, you know, time will tell. And as I mentioned, we are, we are looking for feedback because we have a mysterious bug that manifests once every 24 hours or so that crashes the runtime system with all kinds of fun errors. So. If anybody wants to try running your code for 24 hours and you get this error, let us know. Um, so the last part of this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the garbage collection problems. Um, like I said, we don't have it all figured out. But what we know now is how to kind of make things trigger problems more often. Not to say we can do it 100% of the time, but we know how to make it happen more often. Uh, generally, if you do something wrong in Seago, it may not show up until a garbage collection has been triggered, uh, which means it doesn't happen until your application's been running for a little while. Um, so trying to help the garbage collection happen more often allows us to create more reproducible cases. There's kind of two-ish things that we know that you can do, and there's actually a little bit more you can do with the uh, C compiler flags, which allow you to verify that C isn't doing bad things to memory. But if you use this export go gc equals one in your environment, it sets the go garbage collection rate really high, and it will run all the time very aggressively. So this helps you kind of cause a lot of garbage collections so you can verify your code is working as expected. The other thing you can do is set this cgo check equal to two. And what this will do is have cgo look very carefully at all pointers that are passed to all functions and see that it calls and look for Go looking memory addresses. Um, you may get a few false positives with this, uh, but you know it's better to be safe than sorry. That should be a lowercase e, by the way. Capital E export isn't a shell command in Bash, so sorry about that. Um, and you know, with these two things, we can cause problems for ourselves, uh, and we hope that by resolving them, we make progress and make a more solid product. Um, but really, really, the only way to verify that your code actually works is to use it. One way to use it in a way that is verifying functionality is writing a lot of tests. Uh, we've written some horrible, mean, very ugly, very long-running tests. And uh, still, about 12 hours later, we get an error message and things break, and we get sad. But, you know, at least we're detecting it rather than you guys detecting it. All right? Um, yeah, so that's all I've got. Any questions? Anybody have any answers? <laughs> okay.
Hmm. Okay. So it's interesting uh, that you started by saying don't do that, because that's what everybody's told us online in the forums that we post to. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to do it. Yeah, I, we're going to do it. We got to do it. We, we have things we have to do, and we have to get this product done and out the door. So we will do it. And all we can do right now is look very, very carefully at the SIGO documentation, make sure that we are following all the rules, and then we post questions to the mailing list, we post questions to the forum, we go on Reddit, we go on Discord, we ask questions, and everybody uh, looks at our code, says don't do that, and then once they get over that, they, they kind of go, well, I have no idea. And unfortunately, because it takes 12 hours to reproduce this problem, the C Go developers or the Go developers can't just look at it. So we're in a rock and a hard place until we find that bug. <laughs> oh, I would never. Yeah. So, so that's an. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. And, you know, okay, so I understand where you're coming from. And, you know, Yada DB, we run the process space of the, the application so that we have low latency so we can do transactions really fast. Unfortunately, we can't get away from that easily, right? It's one of our big selling points. And you're right, other databases don't have this problem because they have a separate application that talks over a TCP SOC or a Unix socket. And, you know, they just hope for the best. And I will point out, you're also more right than you know because there's a whole bunch of things in the Go runtime related to signal handling that present issues for us. So 100 percent. More dragons. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> Gosh, she all. I like it. Mm -hmm. Ooh. So, okay, so it's interesting you say that. I say, I, I, so dependency management for, for Yada DB specifically, initially we didn't have a plan, and you know in Go you just kind of put the URL up there. You just put the URL. Yeah, so what, <laughs> what we did is we put a URL which goes to our uh, server, Apache web server, and put some meta flags in the, in the HTML file to point you to the Go repo 
so that we have control over where it is, and also so that we have a consistent URL and so that we can kind of do things. And then we have to figure out, you know, some of the CGO changes, some of the YadaDB Go wrapper changes are dependent upon the next version of the YadaDB database. So now we can't just put it in the master branch because you, you know, we don't have a new version of the database out yet. We release once every few months. So now if we put it there, we merge it in, suddenly users download YadaDB Go wrapper and it doesn't work. getting better, but yes. Can, yeah, can you speak up? Can you speak up? Well, that's against my point. Yeah, I did say that. I, I like go, go dip in it. Okay, that's all right. Yes. That dude who was watching. Yeah, that dude. Yes. This one, yeah. yeah. I'm like, are you and, and by the way, this took me like 40 minutes to get to compile last night to make sure I had it right. Yeah. Now let me. So let me let me step back for a minute and say something because you had an interest, a very good point, right? So the Go community is very very opinionated, right? Oh, just you yelling about dependency management, right? And. Well, yes, anyway, uh, so, so like they're very opinionated. We have some people on the team who are not fans of Go because of how opinionated they are. But also, Python was run by one dude. He had opinions, right? Every, yeah, and everybody seems to like Python. Hmm? Oh, no. Didn't he, st well, that's discussion for later. Just that the, um, the 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 dichotomy. What's the word I'm looking for? The there, there's people who like have very strong opinions and they get very engulfed in flame wars very easily. And in the Go community, I've observed that that's doubly true. And I think the Go creators have to kind of pick and choose their battles. And unfortunately, if they don't choose a battle, they just don't fight it. Yes. It's not the, my point for this was that the the training is actually artificial. The the if you are opinionated, hmm. just find people who have the same opinion as you, even if the opinion is kind of crappy, then 
at the very least, I now have a board member of three people that can apply for 37 or 262 or whatever the actual number of people who agree with whatever opinion I have. And the better problem is, is that the ranges were very tight in that case. Once you got to 50, I, I don't know what you put that over. <laughs> <laughs> so really, well, what we get in trouble for is the finalizer. That's what we get in trouble for. And the Go people get really, really angry with us. But like, this is a place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And your problem is not necessarily their problem. But the, the issue that I, that I that I kind of call out here is that the incentive is artificial. The, 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 there aren't enough people actually working on the problem. They're too busy working on using the thing that made the problem. You're not working on the problem. You're working on your problem. Yes, so, so in, in Tosigo, and that's an interesting point, right? If you're using Go, callbacks are super easy, right? But when you go into Tosigo, you enter this space where... Yeah. Yes. Yes, yeah. So let me just say something really quick. All right. Um, so the the Seago community, the the developers, we go, we post on Golang Nuts uh, Google mailing list, and we usually get responses that are pretty good, right? Um, and we actually haven't had much issues with our, or at least we don't think we've had issues with our uh, callback function mechanism that we have going here. Once we got it in place, it just kind of worked, so we moved on. Not our problem anymore. It's now somebody else's problem. I am telling you how we fixed it, and maybe that will save you some pain, but yes. It <laughs> yes, we don't know why. We don't think it's a function clause, but you're right. We don't know why. Uh, a lot of other people have seen this bug. Mm-hmm. 
Oscar. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've narrowed it down. We're, we're, you know, whenever you have a problem like this, you have to do kind of a, a, a search. We've removed a lot of our more complicated functionality and it still fails. So we're pretty sure it's not the problem. Uh, there could still be a problem there, but it's not the problem we're hunting today. Um, so like I said, this, we, we, we did it. It worked. We moved on. So unfortunately, unfortunately, I take pride in it because it was my idea. So I, I love it. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> They're not very what? Yeah. Sure. I, I, I'm going to move away from that slide. <laughs> All right. Yeah, there are two separate problems. Uh, yes, it works. Yeah. Sure. But, but that's badass. And doing it, like the part that you climb down, whatever rabbit hole you had to climb down to figure that out, yeah. that's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> It works really well for our problem. And it works really well if you're wrapping a library interface. But yeah, if, if I'm using a C library with no intentions of wrapping it, then it's a clunky mechanism. And, yeah. and, and so kind of I think what you're trying to say, and Bosker did have something to say, but what, what you're kind of trying to say is um, you see a problem with an underlying issue with the way the Go community handles things, or maybe communities in general in that we put a Band-Aid on, right? I get my case to work, and then I move on. But the next guy who comes along finds all those same issues. I'm too old to spend the time on that. Okay. Right. You just got to go fight another dragon. Yeah, no, okay, it's no, it's no, like no, playing no, Elder Scrolls and every time you yeah, fast no, travel those dragons <laughs> Dark Souls? Oh. Yeah. You just die over and over again. I just feel like this particular the if what you're going to do is cough up a new paradigm, a new language, a new thing, I 
to a very limited. Stop being, stop being the same asshole as we were before. Like, <laughs> don't just solve your A problem. <laughs> All right. Oscar keeps raising his hand. So, So here's the thing, though. The people who wrote C are the different than the people who wrote Java, are different than the people who wrote Golang. Yeah. And, and writing down the lessons we learned in a cohesive manner that doesn't require me to read textbooks of data like every day is hard. Okay, so they have no excuses then. Shame on them. Yeah, and part of it though. <laughs> right, sure. Right. 